a big bulk of cardiology medications includes the treatment of hypertension and heart failure. And you cannot talk about the treatment of hypertension without mentioning the calcium channel blockers. They are very effective and commonly used. This class contains two versions, either the non-dihydropyridines or the dihydropyridines. The first includes only two medications, verapamil and diltiazem, and they both work on the heart. On the other hand, we have the dihydropyridines, and these are the medications ending with the suffix dipine, like nifidipine and amlodipine, and these work on the vessels. The most commonly used in the clinical practice are the nifidipines and the amlodipines. To put it simply, the muscles in the vascular system and on the heart require calcium to contract. And so by using the calcium channel blockers, we simply block the calcium channels. And this in turn blocks the contraction of the muscles. In the heart, this has the desirable effect of decreasing the heart contractility and in turn decreasing the heart work. On the vessels, by blocking the calcium channels, the smooth muscles surrounding the vessels no longer contract, and so the vessels easily expand and decrease their resistance. And this translates clinically to decreasing the blood pressure. The most powerful calcium channel blocker acting on the heart is verapamil, and the strongest calcium channel blocker acting on the vessels is both amlodipine and nifidipine. When it comes to indications, the main use is for hypertension and to decrease the load of the heart. But there are certain scenarios where we need special medications for special conditions. For example, nimodipine has been frequently used in cases of cerebral hemorrhage because it prevents the cerebral vasospasm after the subarachnoid hemorrhage and it prevents the symptoms of stroke. And it's also the only medication that we cannot use to treat angina. In cases of hypertension urgency or hypertension emergency, we can use either nicardipine or clavidipine. Verapamil and diltiazem can be used in cases of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. And they can also be used as antihypertensive medications if other medications fail. And because the class dihydropyridines dilates the vessels, it can also be used to treat Raynaud's phenomena where the main issue is contraction of the vessels in the hand, leading to fingers ulcers. For the side effects, generally speaking, the dihydropyridines can cause peripheral edema, flushing, and dizziness. And it makes sense because they dilate the vessels and cause them to be more porous. And this, of course, leads to edema and flushing. And due to the third spacing of fluid loss, the patient might experience dizziness. And the non-dihydropyridines have the undesirable effect of cardiac depression, and this can lead to AV block, also constipation, and hyperprolactinemia, which is mainly seen with verapamil. There is also a very uncommon side effect, but exam makers love to ask about, which is gingival hyperplasia. This side effect was thought to be associated with only dihydropyridines, but recent studies showed that it was as common in non-hydropyridines. So it's a side effect of the entire class of calcium channel blockers. Recent studies also showed decreased proteinuria in patients taking calcium channel blockers. However, calcium channel blockers don't appear to be more renal protective than ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Use the link below to get access to the full cardiology medications course. The course includes all heart medications, their mechanism of action, the side effects, and the important notes. With every lecture in the course, you will have the external links referencing the updated guidelines, so that you stay up to date and you don't miss anything. You can also test your knowledge by answering the MCQs and the quizzes included in the course. It's an excellent way to stay updated and to remember everything. Thank you for watching.